Good morning. Good morning. So I know some of you are saying we have not seen a hymn and we're not having communion. It's been a whole year since we were green. So I know sometimes we forget. But today is the beginning of the, the, uh, the Pentecost season or what's commonly known as the ordinary season. And it's a time in which we can focus on really a lot of things, different things, but we kind of lower the church a little bit. We go to the Apostolic Creed and not the Nicene Creed every time, and we uh, we start to study and learn. It's kind of a learning season, and in which we're not having communion today because I want us to see the difference in the ordinary season versus uh, festival season, Advent, Christmas, uh, Easter. Um, Easter, we had communion every Sunday, and it's a big deal. We're celebrating a specific thing. Uh, today, we're going to work on our own individual relationships with God. And so after this, we'll fall back into our first and third week for communion. So should you want communion, please come the first and third. Uh, but for today, we begin our ordinary season. Please stand with me as we confess our sins and receive our true and complete absolution and forgiveness. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Before the hymn 709, I want to look back just really quickly at the Confession and Absolution, and look at this from the ordinary season point of view. If you see the silence for reflection on God's word and self-examination, I think sometimes that's where we are. This is a time for silence and self-reflection and study and learning. The beginning, the invocation is kind of Advent, in which we're asking for God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we're looking for him, we're asking for him. Christmas is the exhortation in which he's given to us and we confess our sins. God, who is faithful and just, gives us Jesus. And then in Lent, we confess our sins, right? And we say, most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. And then in Easter, he says, I forgive you because of my son, you're forgiven. And right now, we're in that ordinary season, right in between them, in which we have time for self-reflection. Please turn to him, 709, and sing with me.
Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being of the Church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. reading is from Genesis chapter 3 verses 8 through 15 they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden but the Lord God called to the man and said to him where are you and he said I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> we'll read Psalm 130 responsibly this morning. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. 
O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. The epistle is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13 through chapter 5, verse 1. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believed and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight monetary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. But the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent, which is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. gathered again so that they could not even eat and when his family heard it they went out to seize him for they were saying he is out of his mind and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying he is possessed by Beelzebul and by the prince of demons he casts out demons and he called them to him and said to them in parables how can Satan cast out Satan for the kingdom is divided against itself that kingdom cannot stand and if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sin will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, He has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they said to him, and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated for him 642. 642.
time in which we must prepare ourselves for the festivals to come. The ordinary season is a time in which we can individually start making ourselves more accessible to God and in such allowing God to be more accessible to us. In the last hymn that we sang, uh, O Living Bread from Heaven, the second verse is always my favorite. When he says, My Lord, you have, you here have led me to this most holy place and with yourself fed me the treasures of your grace. A lot of times we think specifically, yes, this hymn is mostly meant for communion, but it's not just communion that the mysteries are given to us. It's not just through communion that we have the sacraments given to us. Also in prayer and in thought and in time, God gives us the peace and presence that we so desperately want and seek and that he so desperately gives us. I'm reminded a couple of times, I said this also in the Sunday school, but quite often we think that there is a point in which God is no longer around us. And that can't be true. It can't physically or physiologically or spiritually be true. And truth, every breath that we bring, that we breathe, breathe in, is part of God. Every time that we, we take a step on the foundation of the world, we are one with God. Every time we go anywhere, God is in us and around us and by us, always. But quite often we think that we can get to a point in which we have, in a sense, either distanced ourselves so much from God and or that God has distanced himself so far from us. And I hear people tell me all the time, I just want to get back to God. I tell them that you're already there. You see, in truth... God never, ever turns his back on us. It's only us that turns our back on him. And when we turn our back on him and we may walk 30 paces one way, I assure you, God walks those 30 paces with you. And even though it feels distant just because you can't see him, all we have to do is turn around. God promised us that he would never leave us. It's our own self-doubt and worry that gets us to this place. Here we have Jesus and he, in the gospel message today, and he is staring down demons, which should be a pretty neat thing. The people are worried, and they're scared. They're scared of different things. And even Jesus' mother and brothers come, and they say, he's going to get in trouble. He's doing too much. He's saying too many things. He's going to get in trouble. Little do they know that this is the very same Jesus who, in the Genesis story, is walking in the garden and talking to Adam and Eve. Here Jesus is confronting the evil that occurred that day in the garden. He was the very same one that was there for them then, and he is there for them now. And each of us, as much as we need it, he too is there for us. Many times we think that it's difficult. We see here that Jesus says, listen, why do you always think that just because you don't understand or that you're scared, that it's Satan. I do these things for God. Satan himself cannot go against Satan. It doesn't make much sense. And quite often, we like to think everything that happens is because of Satan. And in essence, if we boil this down to a conversation that you may see a child and their mother have here in midday, it would sound like this. The child is saying everything. The devil's against me. Satan's against me. Everything's going wrong. And the mom's saying something to the effect of, you play some part in it yourself. Jesus is saying this for the most part. Yeah, there is Satan. And Satan is out there and he's tempting us, but he is not making us. As we saw in the Genesis uh, study this morning in, Bible store, in, in our Bible class, Satan does tempt them to eat the forbidden fruit. But he can't make them. They do that on their own. Satan may put us in a position in which we want to be further away from God, but he can't make us. We have to do that on our own. I think when we get into those positions, there's a couple things that we do, not unlike what Eve did, if we look back at her response when God asked, what is it that happened? She was very quick to say, well, it wasn't me. It was the serpent that deceived me. 
And when he asked Adam, Adam says, it's not me, it's this crazy woman you made out of my room. And quite often we think the same way, don't we? Well, it's not me. If, if, if I had enough money, I wouldn't have to do this. If I had enough time on my hands, I wouldn't have to do this. If, if you gave me a better spouse or friend or family, then I wouldn't have to do this. When in reality, again, just like the original sin, we think it's so complicating and so difficult, but it's not. The original sin is not a big deal because they ate from the tree of knowledge. The big deal is that God provided them the tree of life, and they failed to eat from that. You see, we typically don't see it that way. We think that there's something over here that, that we want and God doesn't want to give us as if, as if, he's, if he's withholding something from us. When in truth, if we read the scriptures, God gave them the tree of life, which provided for them completely. And God is saying to them, not slap your hand for doing something that you wanted to do. He's saying for them, why did what I give you not become enough? And we look at this quite often in premarital counseling. When a spouse cheats on the other spouse, the hurt isn't necessarily the action. The hurt is, why wasn't I enough for you? So God's looking at them and saying, I provided everything that you needed and wanted. It's you that decided to go to the tree of knowledge, and now you have. God is going to provide. Sometimes we don't think it's enough for us. Sometimes the devil tempts us into a sense in which we think, well, this must be better. But it doesn't mean that God didn't provide or care. Now, the second and last part of this... <coughs> comes in the form of God's reaction to when we stray. Yes, we had the tree of life, but for whatever reason, it became dull to us, and so we went to the tree of knowledge, and we've eaten from that, and now we're scared because the whatever it was that we stole or took or lusted after, the five minutes of pleasure is over, and we're stuck back in reality, and we go... Ah, it wasn't really worth what we thought it was going to be worth. And now we're afraid. And now we see our own selves for what we are, just as Adam and Eve see themselves as being naked for the first time. Shame has come upon them. We look at ourselves and we're disgusted and we say, why did I do that again? Why did I do that again? And we're so afraid of our friends and our family and our relationship with God. When in reality thing that we can't do is what Adam and Eve does here. We can't go and hide in the woods. We can't go and, and, and be somewhat of a coward of our own existence. When in reality, what we must do is what we did when we came in here this morning. We must go to God and confess our sins and plead for forgiveness. Because what God's going to do is provide that forgiveness. Quite often we think of God being angry at us. But again, as we talked about in our Bible study, this is the true picture of God. As you get older and start to, to worry about end-of-life things and start to, start to think about when you see God, really and truly all of us should be thinking about this. Each time we get into a car, we could find ourselves in front of God the next moment. But as we start to worry, and sometimes Christians are the worst at this, we're scared about dying. We don't want to go to God. We think... He's going to be mean. When what happens here in the garden is what's going to happen with you and God. You see, they, they did the very thing that they weren't supposed to do. And then they go and hide from God. And they heard a sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from him. And God said, where are you? And Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. I hid myself. And God goes on to say, Who told you you were afraid? Why did you eat of this tree? He's not mad. He's concerned. He's sad. Truly, he's worried about his children. He comes to find them when they hide. Many times we don't go directly to God when we should to confess our sins and to receive our forgiveness. But again, like we said, it's not God who turns his back on us. It's us that turns our back on him. 
And when we go off into the woods to hide from him, he'll come and find us, wanting to give us that forgiveness, wanting to put us back into a position that we're back on our feet and moving forward and being the man or the woman that God intends us to be. If anyone gets in our way, it's never God. It's only ourselves. God will continue to find you when you least want him to. And at some point, each of us here will give up our spirit and will be in the essence of God in true form. And when we do, I don't think you should be afraid. I think it'll be like the garden here where we're somewhat timid. I used the example in Sunday school this morning. I think when we give up our spirit and we get to heaven, it's more going to be like when you were a child and something scared you and you ran into your mom's arms. That's what seeing God is going to be like. He loves you. He created you. He cares for you. He doesn't want you to sin, but he knows you're going to sin. And when you do, he will come and find you. He will forgive you. He will put you back on your feet. There may be punishment involved, but in the end, he will be there for you just as he always promised to be. And when we know that Jesus is here in the garden walking among Adam and Eve and original sin, and then we see him later in Capernaum, and people are trying to explain to him that he doesn't even know what he's talking about, I'm sure Jesus sometimes just had to take a big sigh and say, you guys really don't know what you're talking about. It's okay, because just like when Adam and Eve ran and hid in the woods, and now that you guys are trying to basically hide behind your own thoughts and provocations, I'm still going to go to that cross. I'm still going to pour out my blood. I'm still going to make things right with me, with God, with your creator. I'm still going to come to you, even when you continually walk away and walk away and walk away. I'm still going to come find you. Today, as we enter the ordinary season, we don't find the mysteries of Jesus only in communion or in church. We find them at home in our meditations and our prayers and our Bible readings and our Bible studies. And if we're not doing that, I would encourage you during this green season to start doing that. Turn around and see where God is. Allow God to stretch his arms out and pick you back up and put you on your feet. It's not because I said that he would. It's because he first promised that he would. May the peace that passes all understanding be in your heart and mind. Amen. Please turn with me now as we sing hymn 728. 728. <laughs>
please stand with me as we confess our faith together in unison in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for our prayers. Almighty God, we give thanks for all your goodness, and we bless you for the love that sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your Holy Church, for the means of grace, for the lives of all faithful and just people, and for the hope of life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that you have done for us, and enable us to show our thankfulness in lives that are wholly given to your service. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. preserve our nation in justice and honor, that we may lead a peaceful life with integrity. Grant health and favor to all who bear office in our land, especially Joseph, our president, and Greg, our governor. Help them to turn their faces towards you, encourage their people in right standing, and that they will do your holy will. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. sanctify our homes with your presence and bless them with joy. Keep our children in the covenant of their baptism and enable their parents to bring them up in lives of faith and devotion. Unite the members of all families in a spirit of affection and service that they may show your praise in our land and in all the world. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. By your word and Holy Spirit, comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Be with those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those whose death draws near and bring consolation to those in sorrow. We now pray for those whom you put on our hearts in silence. We pray for Forrest, Francis, Steve, Earl, Jericho, Dow, Bethany, Brad, Jacob, Stephanie, Cody and Kayla, Victoria, Debbie, Scott, Tim, Katie, Ray, Debbie, Leonard, Ryan, Harold, Gail, Brad, Cecilia, Joan, Tremart, Vivian, Hans, Margaret, Kim, Jackson, Dana, and Mike. We pray a prayer of protection over Daniel, Kirk, Ray, and Anna as they serve in our national defense. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We will now share the peace, but remember, people don't want to share the peace. Give them space. If someone wants to, shake your hand, and by all means, do that. The Lord be with you.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. As we leave today, this church, and go back to our homes or our jobs or our normal life, remember, even though it seems like we're walking alone, God is with you. And when we need him, we can turn around and he will be there with us for us always. Please have a seat as we sing. 575 kids if you want to get the instruments kids get the instruments and as we start to have doubt come into our mind remember our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ <laughs> 